You know, it's very difficult to be negative because I think the opportunities are so great and we just don't see them. If we want to be negative, there is so much information to be negative. And we think that people will change because we're given the bad news. Well, we've gotten used to the bad news, we just keep on zapping on that TV. And we just switch off and listen to some other music and bring us in nirvana. I don't believe that negative news and more negative news and more dramatic pictures is going to make us change. I think the only way we're going to make change people is we expose them to the great things in life. The great opportunities we have and the wonderful examples we have around us, not of people, but of the ecosystems and nature around us. I mean, let me just take this here. Toilet paper. Who in nature uses toilet paper? Now give me a break. Who in nature needs this to be clean? Now let me give you a bit of uh, physiology. Thanks to so many millions of years of evolution, we, the animals, we have liquids going one way and solids going the other way. And the first thing we do is mix it with drinking water. I mean, who's been that stupid? I mean, how could we ever invent a system whereby we believe that hygiene depends on mixing things together which were not supposed to be together, and when you put them together, they smell. You put them together and you mix it with drinking water, and drinking water is supposed to be the most exceptional resource for life. And so then when we mix it, and we go and live in cities, then we have the great difficulty that we need to put it into septic tanks. From septic tanks, the overflow goes into sewage systems. And then we asked our governments to actually take care of the water treatment systems. So you can get rid of your taxes. You pay taxes so we can make it dirty and so that we can have people employed in jobs no one wants. Because do you want to work in septic tanks? Now, the only switch we have to make is to realize that nature designed our body in a way that it should keep separate. And so you have very simple sciences. The science is called the vortex. And the vortex is a science that allows us with a single swirl to separate this liquid from the solid. And if you keep the solids dry, all the bacteria die within 48 hours. If you keep it in the water, you have to add a lot of chemicals to kill it off. And if you don't have now that septic tank anymore, then you don't have the sewage system, then you don't have that water treatment plant anymore. And now you actually can reuse the night soil. English is a nice language. It's called night soil. We can use the night soil again for what it was intended to do. Replenish the soil in the day but we don't do it. Now, I know you didn't come to that conference to hear about toilets and to hear about pee and poop and what you do afterwards. <laughs> I know that was not the objective. But I have to wake you up and say, the opportunity is there to actually save billions of dollars for your governments by simply not being stupid. And if we simply stop doing this, and we have the systems installed in buildings, it already is operational in Sweden and you simply swirl it out, you dry it out, and then you have that other thing which is called urine. You know, urine has no viruses. It's rich in potassium. It's so rich in potassium, actually it's one of the richest sources in potassium. What do we do with it? Out. Mix it with chemicals so it can never be used again. So we have to realize that we are not the bad people on Earth. We are the ignorant people on Earth. We are recent arrivals on this planet, and we are just learning how to behave. But we are still elephants in a porcelain store. We swing around, and our tail knocks everything over. And we didn't realize it. So what we need to do is to start connecting how life really exists on Earth. Because to realize how it connects, we can connect with it again. And today we're disconnected. The challenge that we have is that we have to start connecting. I am part of the Al Gore panel on solutions for climate change. 
And we have these enormous discussions when we hear after, 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 every day, after again, all these proposals. And one of these big challenges is what do we do with CO2? We hear we have too much of it. I don't think I want to hear from any engineer any solution. I want to know in nature who takes care of the CO2. Who takes care of the CO2? Those algae. Those microalgae. So listen to the little story that we have in the Brazil where we have a coal fire power station that has the scrubbers to take out the socks and the knocks. Not these socks, eh? S-O-X. To take out the socks and the knocks. And then you have air with 13% CO2. Now if you have a coal fire power station, it will have a cooling tower and a retention basin. And we pump the hot air into that retention basin and we farm spirulina. And after eight years, we were able to produce so much spirulina that we have too much. I enjoy the idea of going from scarcity to abundance over sufficiency. But we go from scarcity to abundance because in the end of the day, wouldn't you like to have spirulina cheap? Who knows what spirulina is? Do you take it? It's lovely. It's good for your body. Every morning. And how much do you pay? Too much. Because what we have is an economic system where scarcity is the basis. And because we have scarcity, the good is expensive and the bad is cheap. What kind of an economic system is that? I mean, the good should be cheap and the bad should be expensive. And we're not living in Bhutan. Every three months I'm back in Bhutan and there they put 100% tax on junk food. Now that's a good idea, but I'm against taxes actually. So deep in my heart, I feel we have to change the economic system because if we succeed spirulina to go from scarcity to abundance, then we can give it for free. And that's what we've done in the south of Brazil. Over a million children receive spirulina for free under the program called Fomi Zero. And the children will go to school and in the class, one child every night will get a little sachet with 50 grams of spirulina and takes it home, and mom will make cookies for the class for tomorrow. As a result, after eight years, we stamp out malnutrition. Thanks to whom? Thanks to the CO2 from the coal, CO2 from the coal fire power station. Who tells me coal is bad? What is bad is that we burn it and we do nothing with the CO2. That's bad. But saying CO2 is bad is because we don't know what to do with CO2. Then we are bad. We should be more creative. We should connect more. We should imagine more, and we should learn more from those in nature who know how to resolve the issues because they've been at it for a billion years. And so now we have too much spirulina. The spirulina we produce, we can produce it at half a dollar a pound. Half a dollar. And now we have too much, and what do you do with spirulina when you have too much? Well, when you have too much, you start imagining something else, and what do we do? We now start extracting the lipids. So now we have biodiesel from spirulina. People say, you're nuts, you should sell more. No, we're not selling more. We're just going to get some energy now. And when you press out the lipids, then you have a leftover, which is the membrane. And the membrane is an ester. Now I can make polyesters. Do you know La Mer, the cosmetics company? Yes. Again, too expensive. <laughs> but La Mer, what is the main product? Polyesters. For what? For algae. And why is it so expensive? Because they don't buy it from us. Why is it expensive? It's because people have this incredible mindset which was forced on us by Harvard Business School that is core business, core competence. You only focus on one thing and you can only do one thing. But when I'm in a coal-fired power station, I actually have the capacity to produce food, fuel, and cosmetics. And guess what? They pay me with carbon credits. I got four revenues, and it told me it was a problem. What is the problem? We have a world that is at this moment not using the available resources because we don't understand how to use it. And if we start understanding the carrying capacity of this earth, the real carrying capacity, then we're going to be able to live in abundance and not in scarcity. Today we have a billion people, we heard it, who go home, who actually don't even have a home, and we're hungry. 
But what we're needing to understand is how can that productive and consumptive system of ours shift to one that brings us health and happiness. And the top priority has to be health. Health is the key. We do not know how to take care of our health. Spirulina is a good first step, but it's just a small one. We need to start realizing that the opportunities we have are so vast, so enormous. So five years ago, I started doing this research, looking at all the scientific literature. 25 people looked at it for three years, and we identified 2,243 technologies that nature is applying and we should use as well. Nature developed it already. You remember the zebra? The zebra has black and white stripes. Why? No, it's not because it wants to camouflage against the lions. <laughs> the lions still catch them all the time. So either the stripes are no good or the lion is smarter. Basically, the black and white stripes is an air conditioning system. Yeah. Because the black gets hot, the air rises, creates low pressure. The white is the opposite, low pressure, high pressure, wind. So go to your safari next time and look at the zebras. They don't walk fast because they walk too fast. There is no wind. So they're able to cool the surface from the outside using the laws of physics. How do we do it? We use chemistry on the inside. We put polyurethane on the inside. What's smarter, using polyurethane or the zebra trick? Now, I am professor of the Faculty of Architecture in Turin, and the first building we did in Japan, where we played with the black and white, no, we didn't paint it like the zebra, and, you know, I mean, it has to be a little bit aesthetic as well, but we just secured that we have black and white everywhere, and what we succeeded is that the inside temperature, you could put your thermostat at 30 degrees, and it's 25. I'm not as smart as the zebra, the zebra gets 9 degrees lower, I only got 5 but I'm learning, and they had a head start. <laughs> so what we should be realizing that there are tremendous examples around us that permit us to rethink the way we use what is available. And the most predictable thing we have available are the laws of physics. You know, an apple always falls down from the, from the tree, never goes flying. Hot air always goes up. This is beautiful. Because if I want to have a predictable result, I'm going to have to use the laws of physics. But don't forget, the apple has to go up first before it goes down. So first, the apple defies the law before it subjects itself. But the laws of physics are so predictable and so good that I sometimes don't understand how business got involved by trying to use biology and chemistry. The past 50 years, economic development has been driven mainly by chemistry. You remember the graduate? Chemicals, plastics. Well, unfortunately, we have created 100,000 molecules which we know how to put together, but we have no clue how to take them apart. I mean, we are an amazing type of species that knows how to put things together, but not how to take it apart. We're so smart, we can make things no one wants. I mean, what level of intelligence is that? We make things, no one wants it. And this is why we need to start thinking and being inspired by how natural systems do it. Because natural systems always cascade everything. All the nutrients keep on being cascaded all the time. And we need to realize that we can do it as well provided we think in a system, in a connected way. We see that the waste of an animal is actually a feed for a bacteria, and the waste of the bacteria is great feed for the algae, and the waste of the algae is great feed for the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the bentos, and that's again a great feed for the fish, and then we can have the plants, and the plants are great feed, the leftover for the fungi, and so it remains on and on and on. But the key source of energy that nearly everyone is using on Earth is not the sun. The sun only shines half the day on half of the Earth. 
whereas the law of gravity works all day, everywhere. And what we have forgotten is that there are major sources of energy which we completely neglect because we didn't pay attention to it, because we only studied for our exams in high school. We learned in high school that there's something like gravity, but then we never use it. Whereas we are designing buildings in Italy where by the sheer weight of the building, the sheer weight of the building, we can use piezoelectricity, that means pressure exerted on crystals. And those crystals can be salt, that can be any product, can be silk, but we use the crystals, we press it under those pillars, and we generate all the electricity that we need in the building. All. It works now. The problem is that none of the architects learns how to use piezoelectricity. They know about compression strength, and they know tensile strength, and they know a lot of things, but they do not know what this is all about. Because our educational system follows the same thing as Harvard Business School prescribes, core business, core competence. Know more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. And that is why we need to get out of that box. And that box we need to get out of is a box that gives us inspiration, makes us think that the impossible is possible. Because only when you change your mind and agree that the impossible is possible, we're not going to make it. My mentor, Mr. Honda, who founded Honda, told me one simple lesson. Some people dream to escape reality. Other people dream to create a new reality forever. Let's create a new reality forever. Thank you.